Last week I watched that well-known Christmas movie called Love Actually. How many people have watched that movie? I know some people really love that movie. I'm not going to say it's one of my favorite, but it's got some good stuff in it. And my favorite part of that movie happens right at the beginning. It's a scene of the arrival skate at Heathrow Airport in London, England. And there's scenes of people that are coming out of the gates and they're being embraced by their family and kissed and, and hugged by, by those as they meet them coming off the plane. And over top of this scene, you hear the, the words of the actor Hugh Grant, who is playing the Prime Minister. And this is what he said. Whenever I get gloomy with the state of the world, I think about the arrivals gate at Heathrow Airport. General opinion starting to make out that we live in a world of hatred and greed. But I don't see that. It seems to me that love is everywhere. Often it's not particularly dignified or newsworthy, but it's always there. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, old friends. When the planes hit the Twin Towers, as far as I know, none of the phone calls were from, from people on board were messages of hate or revenge. They were all messages of love. If you look for it, I've got a sneaking suspicion. Love actually is all around. I think that's a wonderful soliloquy. Right up there with anything Dickens or Shakespeare has ever written. Simple, but profound. And every time I'm at an airport back in the day when you would be at an airport and I look at the arrival skate, I always think of those words as I watch people being reunited with loved ones. Love actually is all around. And I think it's absolutely true. I've always believed in the adage that you see what you're looking for. And if you look for it, it's there. I was at the mall last week just briefly picking something up and even though it was COVID, it was still pretty busy there. People hustling and bustling to get last minute things. And I noticed a couple. I would put them in their mid 80s, maybe even a little bit higher than that. They were sitting on a bench eating an ice cream cone. They had their mask pulled out, pulled down. They were eating their ice cream cone with one hand. With the other hand, they'd reached across and they were holding hands with each other. Such a simple little moment, but a glimmer of love in the hustle and bustle. And I think that's what makes love so powerful. It's not complicated. It's not confusing or confounding. It doesn't require batteries. There's no assembly required. It's simple. It is simply the movement of the heart to make a connection. It is a desire to be affirmed and appreciated. It is a longing to feel that we matter to someone just as someone matters to us. And I've learned over my years in ministry that there are certain times when love intersects with life in such a powerful way that we cannot help but lift our heads to it, much like a sunflower swiveling to face the dawn. One of the biggest shifts in ministry that I've ever made over the past few years is how and when I use the love passage. You know that passage from the Bible. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and so on and so on. I'm sure you recognize the passage. I used to say those words almost exclusively at weddings, but now I say them almost exclusively at funerals. And that's because a funeral, as much as a wedding, is a celebration of love, maybe even more so. When someone who has been precious to us passes away, we're not remembering the arguments, the mistakes, the hurts or the heartaches. We're remembering the good times, the adventures we had together, the moments we shared, the way they made us laugh. We are remembering love. And that's what a eulogy is. Really, it's just a love song to life. Funerals, as tough as they are, take us into the heart of love. And it works on the other end, too, at the beginning of life. If you want to see some profound love, hang out in a maternity ward. I really believe that for many people, when they bring a child into the world, that's when they learn just exactly what love is all about, what it truly means to give it, and to share it. And that's why the Christmas story is as beautiful and compelling as it is. It is in the mystery of our faith. 
God choosing to enter the world as the ultimate symbol of love. A child, a baby, something so vulnerable and fragile that its only hope of survival in the world is to be received and held by love. My mother groaned, my father wept, and into the dangerous world I leapt. William Blake said that. And it's true. A baby enters this uncertain life with as yet unexpressed hope that the love that surrounds him in that moment will be both doorway into and shield from the world. I've always believed that the two places where love is felt the deepest and is the most profound is when a newborn comes into the world and when a loved one leaves it. It's in the bookends of life that we realize that love is the beginning and ending of all things, that it really is what matters the most. In fact, it's the only thing ultimately that matters at all. So if love truly is most found in the bookends of life, what about all those pages in between? If love is so simple, so beautiful, so necessary, so compelling, why isn't there more of it? Or why do we complicate it? Why do we miss out on it? Or why do we limit it? Well, on this Sunday in which we reflect on love, I want to share with you what I believe is the most fundamental mistake that we make about love. And if we could only get over this mistake, we could journey so much more deeply into the core of love's power. Are you ready? The biggest mistake we make. Too often, we think we have to earn it. You're saying, no, no, I, that's not me. I get it. Love is unconditional. I know that. You might say that, but you believe it, and you act that way. Because we do the opposite all the time. If I wear this, he will like me. If I do this nice thing, she will think better of me. We act as if love is the return that we get on making the right investment. And we all do it. And do you know why we all do it? Because as children, for the most part, our parents gave us that message. Grandma wants you acting your best, so you better not let her down. No one's going to want to want to be with you if you have that gloomy look on your face. Be good, and you're going to get a treat. We've all heard it from our parents. We've all probably done it as parents. For all kinds of reasons, we want our, our kids to act well and to thrive. But the message is, love is something to be achieved and won and earned. And that's my biggest problem with Santa Claus. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the old guy. But what do we tell our kids? If you're not good, Santa won't come. Earn, earn, earn. I remember this as clear as yesterday, and my mom who's watching the service is going to deny this to the hilt. But I remember sitting in my living room. Well, I was maybe four years old. My brother was six years old. I think we'd been acting out a little bit. It was, I think, like the day before the day before Christmas. And I remember my mom sitting us in two chairs in front of the TV. I still remember the movie that was on. It was Gentle Ben. Remember that movie? And my mom said this. Santa's watching. And if you don't sit still on this chair for the next hour and be good, he won't come. I know my mom's saying right into the TV right now, I never said that. Yes, you did. You asked your other son as well. Now I lost my place. <laughs> the point is, I know why she did it, and it worked. She achieved her goal, which is probably just an hour of peace. But here's the point. As adults, we are all the living embodiment of all the message that we've received in our lives. And for so many of us, we've learned to equate love and acceptance as something that we earn, that we have to strive for. And so we struggle all our lives to do that. And when we fall short, we feel guilty or ashamed. And we say, next time I'll be better. I'll be good enough so that I can be loved. And we brush ourselves off and we start again. And around and around we go, but we never quite seem to get to where we want to go. Why? Because we are thinking about it the wrong way. The most important message Jesus came to share with us, 
and I will argue this point with any theologian or any minister in the world, the most important message Jesus came to share is that love is a gift. It's not a reward. It's a gift. It's not something that we strive for. It's something that we open to. It's not based on merit. It's given through grace. It does not require perfection. In fact, it is a very antidote to perfection. How do we know Jesus believed this? Because he told it again and again in all the stories he told. The father of the prodigal son who welcomed him home after he messed up. The landowner who forgave his tenant so that his tenant could feed his family. The Samaritan who bandaged the wound of the one who could never pay him back. Love is a gift. Love is God's gift, embodied, incarnated, made real in the child of Bethlehem. And when we shift from seeing love as a reward that we have to find to love as a gift that we already have, we release its power, its energy, and its potential. Judith Oliver, who is a retired United Church minister and part of our congregation here at Northwest. I know some of you know Judith. A while ago, Judith sent me this story, and I asked her if I could use it, and she said yes. It was an experience she had in her job before she became a minister. She was a nurse. So let me tell it in her words. When I was a young nurse working in pediatrics in the nursery, there were two newborns. One was flawless, a bit of blonde hair, perfect head, blue eyes open, just looking around. I thought, what a beautiful baby. Right next to her was another baby, sweet, sleeping, brown hair, but with a birth defect that would require surgery. I thought to myself as I gazed on these two infants that God would look upon them and God would say to both, oh, what a beautiful baby. Not long after that, the minister where I lived was expecting their first baby. Finally, the time came and the congregation was super excited. That morning, he said to them, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we have a baby boy. And there were hoorays and there was applause. The bad news is, well, he was born with Down syndrome. There was silence in the church, as no one quite knew how to react. And yet, said Judith, never was there a more loved little boy than that child. The congregation took him into their hearts and gave so very much. And Judith ended the story by saying this, society has a way of judging the imperfect until the day they adjust their thinking and then love flows in buckets. Judith nails it in that story. Love isn't the reward for perfection. It's exactly the opposite. It's the counterpoint to perfection. It shines its light upon places of imperfection or imperfect people and proclaims, but you are still loved. You are still valued. Not because you are perfect, but because you are you. But it's even more than that. Like that congregation who saw in that vulnerable and fragile child a resting place for all their love, a need for all their love, love is what brings out the best in us. When we perceive someone as valuable, a vulnerable or fragile, for whatever reason, most of us wouldn't rush in with condemnation and judgment, but we rush in with love because we understand that that's what's most needed in that situation. Love is powerful. It's the spirit that can bond brokenness, that can give value where there is uncertainty, that can encourage where there is doubt. It is the adjusting of our thinking to realize that perfection is only an illusion, an illusion that actually keeps us from letting love flow like buckets. But when we give up that need to seek perfection, when we give up that need to be perfect, when we stop trying to earn it and simply try to reflect it, try to be loving, life gives back to us in buckets because we've let go of that draining, tiring, wearying attempt to earn love. And instead, we're simply focused 
on sharing the love that is already with us. And that changes everything. When we go from earning to sharing, it releases in us a spirit of generosity, kindness, goodwill, peace, and gratitude. The very qualities that we need for a good life. Adjust your thinking and love can flow in buckets. I'll never forget back in Sussex, New Brunswick, one Christmas season, the Salvation Army called uh, all the ministers in town and said that we don't have enough people to cover the kettles uh, for Christmas. Could you help us out? So we all agreed to spend one day at the mall standing beside the Salvation Army kettles, ringing the bells and um, receiving donations. It was, it was a lot of fun. I had some great conversations standing beside that kettle, including a guy who asked me if there was ever a war would the Salvation Army step up and help defend the country. Anyway, but there was one visitor I'll never forget. At noon, a guy came over. He was dressed pretty shabbily. He came over and he said, uh, hey, buddy, can you give me some money out of the pot? I need to get some food. I said, well, I can't do that. I said, first of all, it's not my money to give. And even if it was, I can't get into the kettle. It's, it's locked. I said, but I'm happy to help you out. And I reached into my pocket and pulled out a $20 bill and I gave it to him and off he went. About 20 minutes later, I see him coming back towards me. And I'll admit, my first thought was, well, he spent the $20 and, and he's going to come, come back and ask for some more. Instead, he came over, reached into his pocket, pulled out the $20 bill, and stuck it in the kettle. I didn't know what to say. I said, well, didn't you want something to eat? He said, yeah. He said, I'll, I'll figure that out later. But he says, as I was leaving, I heard them playing Silent Night over the speaker. He said, that song always gets me right here. And I thought to myself, you know, all my life I've been asking people for stuff. It never occurred to me that if I'd started giving stuff back, giving others things, that my life may have, may have turned out a little different. And he shuffled away. I'll never forget that incident. That man was not perfect. But out of that imperfection, a bit of magic of Christmas arose. And in that simple gesture, love became stronger. A gesture thinking and love flows in buckets. The celebration of Christmas is the celebration of God's love made manifest in the world. And so we have to keep telling ourselves that message over and over and over again until we get it, until it sinks in, that God's spirit of love is not earned, and nor is God's spirit of love static. It flows through the cracks and crevices of our shortcomings and mistakes. It wraps itself around our fears and our worries. It takes what is dark and broken and brings it into the light of renewal. And all it asks for us, from us, is that we accept it. It is a gift, the greatest gift that we could ever receive. The gift of God's unconditional love for us. Eleanor loved her grandmother. They had so many adventures together. Loved to spend time with each other. Eleanor's favorite thing that she did with her grandmother was go out for strawberry ice cream. They both loved strawberry ice cream. After a while, Eleanor started to notice that her grandmother wasn't herself. She was starting to forget things. She couldn't find her keys or remember where she was going on any given day. Eleanor was worried and asked her mother what was wrong with grandma. Her mother told her that she had something called dementia, which meant that her memory didn't work as well anymore. And as a result, she couldn't be by herself, but she would be moving into a retirement home with people who could take care of her. Eleanor was confused and sad, and she asked her mom if she could go visit her grandmother. Of course, said her mom. And said Eleanor, Eleanor, can we bring her her favorite treat? Can we bring a strawberry ice cream? Of course, said her mom. So later that week, Eleanor and her mom went to visit her grandmother. And Eleanor came in with a bowl of strawberry ice cream. Her grandmother's face lit up when she saw the ice cream. She thanked her and she began to eat, but said very little to Eleanor or her mother. Eleanor wondered why her mother, why, and her mother said, well, she's just lost in her thoughts right now. The next week they went again. And Eleanor bought a bowl of ice cream and her grandmother lit up again and started to eat. Again, it was a quiet visit. Finally, after the third time, 
Eleanor asked her grandmother as she ate her ice cream, Do you know who I am? Her grandmother said, You're the beautiful little girl who brings me ice cream. But do you remember my name? Her grandmother shook her head. Suddenly, Eleanor knew that her grandmother may never remember her name again. Overcome by a sense of emotion, she said to her, Oh, Grandma, that's okay if you don't remember my name. Just know that I love you very much. She watched as a tear rolled down her grandmother's face, and her grandmother said, Love. Love is something I remember. Eleanor, now grown up and reflecting on that story, said this. I learned a very important life lesson that day at my grandmother's side. That even though everything can be taken from us in life, so long as we have love, we will always have something. And life will always have value and meaning. It may not be perfect, it doesn't have to be. Love will fill in the cracks. Love will wipe away the tears. Love will forgive the mistakes. Love will speak the words that no longer come to our lips. Love will wrap itself around us and hold us tightly. And in the end, that's what matters. In the end, that is all that matters. Friends, you will find what you look for. And if you look for it, I have a sneaking suspicion that love actually is all around. Amen. <laughs>